Um, all right, a little bit about me besides the fact that I am a certified elder law attorney. Um, I've been practicing for 23 years now. Um, our main office is over at the Cobb Galleria. Um, we have one other attorney in the practice. She's also certified. But we also practice elder law in a holistic manner. So to that end, in our practice, we have three women who we refer to as care coordinators. So I have a nurse and two social workers. We then have three public benefit specialists, some people who are strictly administrative, and some people who deal with marketing. So we've got 13 people in all in our practice. And elder law is all that we do. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons that I think that there are so few elder law attorneys uh, both in the state of Georgia and nationwide is, it's relatively speaking a new area of law. So NALO, which is kind of the umbrella national organization, has only been around for about 30 years right now. But as we've seen more and more people aging and having issues, loss of functional capacity, it's become a more and more important area of law as we really are trying to help people figure out how to get through the long-term care maze. So that's what we're really looking at here. And the biggest issue that we have is nobody knows what an elder law attorney is or does. And part of that has to do with the name. Nobody wants to think of themselves as an elder. And then the name that we really should have, we really should be called the family lawyers because we're really helping to get people all on the same page to figure out how to take care of mom or dad. Now, unfortunately, the divorced people <laughs> have the family law name, which should really be anti-family law. <laughs> so that's really kind of where we are right now. So it's really trying to educate people about who we are and what we do. Ah, let's get it fixed. All right. Thank you, Narcy. So I'm just going to take a few minutes and talk about what are the basic documents that everyone should have in place, not just parents uh, or our elders, but you all as well. So we've got a set of basic documents that we want to look at in Georgia, and <clears throat> The real difference also that we look at between elder law practitioners and estate planning practitioners is estate planners are in general looking at what happens when somebody dies. What we're really looking at is what happens when somebody is still living but has lost capacity. So we want to be able to plan for that and deal with those situations. So the first thing that we want to do is have a power of attorney in place. <clears throat> so we've got a financial power of attorney and that's where you're going to appoint somebody to make your financial choices when you're unable to make them for yourself. And it does get very frustrating in our practice when we have people come in and mom or dad has already lost a lot of capacity and they've got nothing in place. So what's our option in that case? Guardianship and conservatorship. So having to run off to the probate court and then have to ask permission for everything that we want to do. <clears throat> so if we can have some planning done ahead of time and have powers of attorney in place, that can save a lot of time, money, effort. It allows things to run more smoothly. So the first thing we look at is the financial power of attorney. And we want it to cover pretty much everything that you could do if you were making the decision yourself. Two ways these come into effect. One, it becomes effective immediately when you sign it. Two, it's what's known as a springing power. So some event has to occur before the power becomes effective. Now, the one that I see if somebody does have a springing power when they come into the office most frequently is that two physicians have to say that the individual can no longer carry on their affairs. 
So I pose you this question. How many doctors like to make that call? And the answer is not many. So if that's the case, I will tell people, you may as well have no power of attorney in place if that's the trigger. Because you're going to have a hard time finding doctors that want to say that you don't have that capacity anymore. They just don't want to make that call. Now, when we talk about these, we want a general durable power of attorney. And the general means, again, that it's going to cover everything. The durable means that it is still valid even if the person has lost their cognitive capacity. And in Georgia, all powers of attorney are presumed to be durable unless stated otherwise. Then when we get into the elder law world, we want to have three specific powers in them. And one is the ability to make gifts, typically in unlimited amounts, the ability to create trust of any kind, and ultimately the ability to apply for and to deal with government benefits. So most of our clients have less than a half a million dollars of total net worth. So we're not worried about gift or estate tax issues at this point. Then we also want to make sure that the document is properly executed. In Georgia, that means the person making it signs the document. We want to have two witnesses and a notary, and that will allow any action to be able to occur as we sit in Georgia. Um, in general, I try to stay away from naming two people or more as agents at one time. Uh, that only causes trouble. Financial institutions don't like it. Uh, and so I will tell people, please choose one, and we'll have a series of backups that go along with that. So that's on the financial side. On the healthcare side, we have what is known as now the Georgia Advanced Directive for Healthcare. Came into effect in 2007, really is an offshoot from the Terry Schiavo case out of Florida. Uh, this document takes what used to be our healthcare power of attorney and what used to be our living will, combines them into one document, and lets us carry on from there. So again, this is where you appoint somebody to make your healthcare choices for you only when you can't make them for yourself. Anytime you can make the choice, you get to make the choice. You put down what your treatment preferences are. As my grandmother used to call this, this is the plug pulling document. So when do you want your plug pulled? It also lets you make choices such as who's gonna be your guardian if you need one? Do you want to be buried or cremated? Are you willing to be an organ donor? also has a HIPAA release. They also wanted to make this document really easy to get into effect. So all you have to do, get the document, put your initials or check marks in the appropriate places for what your wishes are. You can write in specific instructions. Then you sign and date it. Now nobody actually has to see you sign this document. So you can get it all completed today, take it to your next door neighbor tomorrow and say, this was my signature, please witness it, and then take it down to the bank or somewhere else next week and get a second witness on it. It's that easy to get into effect. And if any of you all want the statutory version of this document, please feel free to go on my website. It's there, you can download it, complete it, take it from there. But it is important to have in place because if you don't, then your wishes aren't going to be carried out. Yep. Can you take questions now? Or sure. Uh, in addition to the advanced director, there's also uh, a power of attorney for medical issues other than that. I mean, when I run medical offices in the past, um, we would get them constantly. I have a uh, Son, we have a durable power of attorney by all the medical issues. One of the issues that came up in running the practices was somebody would come in with a durable medical power of attorney, tell us what to do, and then some member of the family 
or somebody else would come and say no. All right? And it ends up in a very contentious situation. Uh, without going into the Schreiber case, that bad. <laughs> Can you tell us, you know, what is the um, strength of that power of attorney? And what do you do when it's contested by uh, another member of the family? Well, the... So up until 2007, we had the healthcare power of attorney. So this really document replaces that. You will look at whichever is the most current document and that is the document that is in place and that's what you go with. How do you deal with institutions or anything else that say, no, you've got that and somebody else is coming and contesting it, so I'm not gonna honor it? If the institution is not honoring it, the institution is wrong and so um, you know if that's the case then you're going to end up in a court scenario potentially if the people are not willing to get on the same page so that would be correct now typically if it's a an emergency type of a scenario you'll get a court hearing within potentially an, a matter of hours so that can be done, but whoever has the legal document that is the most current legal document, that is what the institution should be accepting. So, and you know, obviously none of us can control what the compliance and legal officers of any of the big medical institutions are going to say or do. And they want to try to stay out of family conflicts. So that's kind of the sad thing we look at there. So then we next look at how are we going to move assets from one generation to the next. Um, jointly owned property, payable on death, beneficiary designations, a will and or a trust are the simple ways that we are going to go about that. So kind of starting to get into the meat of what we do in our practice, we're really helping people figure out what's the situation going to be as they've lost capacity and they're going to have to deal with paying for long-term care. So when we get into long-term care, we really have a few settings in which we're going to get that long-term care. So the first one is, is somebody is either living at home or in some kind of independent living type of a situation and they want to stay there. In order to allow them to stay there, we may need to get paid care coming in. And in Metro Atlanta, through an agency, paid caregivers run typically between $15 and $25 an hour. And you can see that that starts to add up really quickly. In general, the more hours someone works, the less they will charge per hour. If we have somebody there on a 24-7 live-in basis, and what that means is that there is an extra bedroom for the caregiver, and they at least theoretically can sleep for eight hours a day, that will start at about $6,500 a month. And then, of course, we still have all the costs of the living place on top of that. And then if we've got somebody there 24 seven on multiple shifts, that will start around $10,000 a month. And not many people can do that for very long. And especially if I'm looking at a married couple with one spouse who's well and the other one needing care, my well spouse is really thinking, and generally it's the wife, she's gonna be living out under a bridge somewhere in not too long of a time frame. So we're really trying to help her figure out how she's going to deal with that care situation. And then, of course, all the emotional issues that go along with that. The first level of care we have outside of an independent setting is the world of personal care homes and assisted living facilities. Until about two years ago, all of these were covered under the same license. Everything was known as a personal care home. <clears throat> We've now got a licensure for assisted living communities. And 
technically what that means is, is that if you were able to get into the assisted living community while you were still able to transfer, help to ambulate, then even if you become bed bound, they do not have to send you out of that facility. And so we're now somewhere between 50 and 75 facilities in the entire state of Georgia <clears throat> have the assisted living community license. But there are a lot of places that used to be known as assisted livings that have only opted to stay with the personal care home license. You won't notice a real big difference on the face if you go to visit any of these places. However, when we think about personal care homes, in general, we've thought about the smaller places. Most of them are in houses, two to 10 beds, and it's kind of like a small family atmosphere. Some of the small personal care homes are outstanding, and they have a much better caregiver to care receiver ratio than the bigger places but other ones you wouldn't want your dog living in. So you really have to do your research if you're looking at them and visit them, understand and see what they feel like. The assisted livings in the larger personal care homes, typically 20 up to 200 beds, multiple meal choices, the little bus to go to the Publix and the Walmart, um, activities director, and some of them are so nice and they've got so much going on, I will tell people it's like living at one of the hotels at Disney World. And they really feel like that sometimes when you get inside them. So the price cost on those types of facilities runs on the very low end from about $1,500 a month. Again, that's where you don't want your dog living, up to in excess of $6,000 a month. And there are two main factors that go into that cost. The first is how nice is the facility together with how expensive is the ground it's built on. And the second is how much care is needed within the facility. And if we have married couples moving into a facility together in the same apartment, they will typically set a base rate for the spouse who needs the most care and then have an add-on fee for the second spouse. And the add-on fee will typically range between $500 and $1,000 a month. <clears throat> and then the last place we have is the place we all swear we never want to be, and that is the skilled nursing facility, more commonly referred to as the nursing home. Now, in general, there are two reasons that people end up in a nursing home. One is, is because they need so much care, there's no other place they can be taken care of. So if I've got somebody who's on a ventilator or a trach, they're not going to be able to be in an assisted living. The other reason is, is because they've run out of money and there's no place else they can go to get care. Now, if you are paying for a nursing home out of pocket in Metro Atlanta, on the low end, they're going to start at about $5,500 a month, and they will go up in excess of $9,000 a month. Now, typically when I'm talking to people in the office, this is where they start to get really antsy because they've got no idea as to what these costs are, and they're completely unprepared for them. So be aware and take action while you can. So there are very limited ways to pay for long-term care. And you can see them right here on this slide. Private pay, meaning using your income and assets, or if you're helping out your parents, they may want you to help pay for them. I see that sometimes long-term care insurance and I tell everyone that they ought to look at long-term care insurance as at least a part of your overall financial plan. It may work for you and it may not work for you, but at least take a look at it. And if you do, always be sure that you're comparing apples to apples. 
because we've got all kinds of different policies out here now. We've got straight policies that pay up to X amount of dollars a day for some kind of a time frame, but then we've got policies that are riders typically on a life insurance policy. So take a good look at it. May work, it may not. Then we've got Medicare, Medicaid, and different VA benefits that we can look out there at as well to help pay for long-term care. So I will start by talking about VA benefits. So I found it interesting that you all are getting ready to you know, help veterans get back into the workforce, um, but the VA helps out with a whole lot of stuff as well. The problem is, is that the VA is actually the largest department within the government. And in general, in the VA, the right hand has no clue as to what the left hand is doing, much less what all the possible benefits are. So it can be very difficult to get through the system. So in the VA benefits section, as opposed to the medical section, there are really two parts of benefits. And one is what's called service-connected compensation. I'm only gonna talk about that for a few minutes. It's not something that we handle. But service-connected compensation means that the veteran had to have been injured or contracted disease due to their service time. Once we have that, then Typically, VA medical is going to sign a percentage disability rating to that veteran. And that disability rating can run anywhere from 0% to 100%. But in the VA world, if you have multiple issues, 10% for one and 10% for another doesn't equal 20%. So in general, if I've got somebody who worked on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier, that person may have really bad loss of hearing. Typically, you're gonna look at a 10% disability rating for that. Then if they had something else happened with a 10%, they're gonna still be at 10%. But if you start getting bigger things and adding them together, eventually, you will get to 100%. So for instance, one of my high school classmates was an Army Ranger, career military. About three years ago, he jumped out of an airplane and his parachute deployed when he was about 100 yards off the ground. So he broke 86 bones. And when they looked at him and added everything up, if you added everything together, he would have been 450% disabled. So they got him to 100% on that. Now the biggest reason I talk about this particular part of the benefit is um, for people who actually served in Vietnam. So if you know somebody who served in Vietnam, that individual has a presumptive exposure to Agent Orange and Agent Orange is a presumptive cause of a whole bunch of diseases. Multiple cancers, type two diabetes, and the blindness that may go along with that. ALS, Parkinson's disease. So if you know somebody that fits that description, tell them that they should look at getting a VA comp claim put in place. And there are no financial constraints to that. Yes. Um, there are other places that somebody may have gotten ALS through their time in the service. So if you can tie his ALS to his military service, is your mother still living? No. Okay. Right. There are a lot of different things that, yeah, there's a lot of different things that have happened in the military that can cause some of those neurological type diseases like that. 
So bear that in mind. So the other side of the VA is what's called non-service connected pension. And that's what we will spend a few minutes talking about. And typically the highest level that can be added on top of the pension is called aid and attendance, technically meaning that the claimant needs the aid and attendance of another person to make it through their activities of daily living. And when I talk about activities of daily living, I'm talking about bathing, grooming, dressing, toileting, transfer and ambulation, and feeding, just so you understand that. And this is good for either a living veteran or a surviving spouse. So these are the service requirements that are out there to get this benefit. The veteran had to have served active duty military for at least 90 consecutive days, at least one of those days during wartime, and have a discharge that is other than dishonorable. And you really have to meet those, that criteria before they'll look at anything else. So I had one client entered the Navy during World War II. Part of the training was they had to jump off of a, dive, a high dive. When she refused to do that, they kicked her out after 81 days. So she couldn't get the benefit. I had one client who entered the military the day after World War II officially ended. He couldn't get it. And then I had one who was discharged seven days before Vietnam started. So he couldn't get it. But for a lot of people, this benefit is the difference in paying for care or not. So besides the things that I just covered, there are a couple of other things that we're looking at when we're looking for this benefit. Now, in 2015, you can see what the maximum benefits are. So for a married couple, 2120, single veteran, 1788, and for a surviving spouse, 1149. And that is money that would come out monthly. And for a lot of people, when we add this together with the rest of the income that they have, they're actually able to afford to get either some care at home or to pay for an assisted living level type of a place. So it can be a very valuable thing to have. I say here, uh, with some frequency about the people who uh, are being asked to move some of their assets around qualify for that. Is there any heavy experience with that or tips or a place that would Yes, and I will get into that in just a couple of minutes. So um, you're probably, I don't know, two or three slides ahead of me on that. Um, so besides the basic service requirements, we do have um, other things that we have to get to um, as far as the requirements for the benefit goes. So the first thing that we look at from the financial perspective um, are the asset limits. And in general, we look at a married couple needing to have $80,000 or less in countable assets and a single veteran or surviving spouse something less than $50,000. But these are rules of thumb because in, for the most part, nothing at the VA is written in stone other than what the maximum benefit is. So if somebody is older, they may need to have less assets. If, they, uh, if their expenses are you know, really close to what their income is, they may need to have less. So it's kind of like having to be an alchemist figuring out what's the formula that we want to use here. But as we sit in the VA world today, there are no transfer penalties. So we could give away assets, place them into a trust. There are multiple ways to get people to those asset levels today. Now on January 25th this year, the VA proposed putting in a look back period and creating transfer penalties. 
They haven't done anything yet. They've tried to get this, that through Congress multiple times. None of it has happened. So there are different things that we can do now. Yes, the primary residence is an exempt asset, but we always want to look at that on the front end because a lot of times when people look at the VA, they may be getting care at home, but ultimately they move into a facility somewhere and then they want to sell the house. And we don't want the house to go from being exempt to being a countable asset when it's liquidated. So always things to look at there. But there are multiple ways to get people to that level. And now you see a list of the other things that don't count towards the asset level. But in the VA world, we're usually talking about the liquid assets. And the one that we have the most difficult dealing with in the VA world are large IRAs. Because in general, we don't want to take those out of IRA status and pay the tax on them and deal with uh, putting them onto benefit. And you have to live in your house? Or no. Um, if you end up making your primary residence into a rental house, you can still do that. So again, there's no penalty as we sit today for giving away assets. So the second thing we look at from the financial perspective is the income situation. And what we're really looking at here in the VA world, they start with gross income. So let's take an average family that I see, and they've got $3,500 a month worth of gross income. If you call the VA and ask them about that benefit, and you say, my parents make $3,500 a month, VA will probably say they can't qualify, they make too much money. And that's because that $3,500 worth of income is greater than the maximum benefit of 2120. But what VA really bases this on is a number that's called income for VA purposes. And the way we arrive at that is we take gross income and we subtract all unreimbursed recurring medical expense. So what counts is that? It's Medicare Part B, D, and secondary premiums. The big ones, though, are the cost of care at home, care and assisted, or care in a nursing home. So if this married couple moves into assisted, they've gotten a good deal, it's gonna cost them $4,000 a month. In my example, 3,500 income minus $4,000 for the facility would give them a negative 500 in their IVAP. VA does not like negative numbers, so they round that up to zero. And when that number hits zero, they will get the maximum benefit. But as my intake specialist likes to tell people, this is a benefit where you have to spend it to get it. And so that's what we're really looking at. So if, every, if all the expenses add up to more than um, the income level, then they're going to get the benefit and they're going to get the maximum benefit. But if their income is greater than the benefit, they will not get anything. So that's what we have to look at in the income formula. Um, a few things about the VA process. As I told you, VA is a very large governmental entity. They do nothing quickly. Typically, we see it taking six to eight months for them to process one of these claims. But once it's done, they pay it retroactively to the original award date or when they get the application, whichever comes first. The second is, if my claimant has dementia of any kind, in the VA's eyes, that person is incompetent. And someone will have to be appointed to be the VA fiduciary. And that will typically add six to 10 weeks to getting their retroactive check, but they will start putting the monthly amount into the account right away. No, the VA does not recognize a court conservator even. So it's very similar to the Social Security Administration's representative payee process, but the VA sends out a field agent 
to meet both with the claimant and the person handling the money, and then they make them set up a separate VA fiduciary account that the money flows into. And then the only people who can actually help to file a VA application have to have been accredited by the general counsel of the VA. So both of the attorneys in my office are. Um, so therefore the paralegal who works under us is as well. Um, the reason I tell you this is there are a lot of people out here trying to get into people's pockets right now through this benefit and put them into what may not be appropriate financial instruments in order to do so while not thinking about the possibility that these people may need Medicaid at some point on down the line. So they're not looking at the situation globally. So I tell people there are two things to always ask. One, who's accredited with the VA? Two, how do you get paid? Because nobody can actually charge for completing a VA application. Um, and we want to because nobody works for free. And the final way we look at paying for care is nursing home Medicaid. So about 80% of the people in Georgia who are in nursing homes have Medicaid as their primary payment source. So Medicaid is a needs-based program. So we really have to hit various targets for both assets and income for somebody to qualify. Now, as opposed to Medicare, that is the so-called entitlement program that we all become eligible for if we've been in the workforce when we turn 65 or if we have been determined disabled and had a prior work record. So if we get SSDI, after we've been on that for two years, we also get Medicare as our primary payor uh, for medical. So um, we have five baseline requirements in order to get nursing home Medicaid. The applicant has to be 65 blind or disabled. Um, and in Georgia, it is administered by the Department of Community Health. It's a joint federal and state program. So while everything has to fall within the federal rules, every state has some differences in it. So things that would work for Medicaid qualification in Georgia may not work in other states and vice versa. So you have to look very closely at that. And you can see the 5931 is the average cost in the entire state of Georgia right now in a nursing home. So the five basic requirements are these. Over 65, blind or disabled, the individual has to need nursing home level care. And that's determined by the doctor. So two things you have to do to get into a nursing home are known as a DMA6 and a level one. The individual then has to actually be institutionalized for at least 30 days before you can apply. And that can either be just in a nursing home or a combination of hospital and nursing home. Then we get into the dollars and cents pieces. Medicaid world, you look at income first, then we look at assets. So in Georgia, we are known as an income cap state, and the current income cap is $21.99 per month. And that is for the individual going on to Medicaid. So if we've got a married couple, for this point, we're only covering the one going on to Medicaid. If income is greater than $21.99, we have to jump through an extra hoop and that extra hoop is called a Miller Trust, which is also known as a Qualified Income Trust. And it's really just a way that for people over $21.99, but underneath the amount that it costs for the nursing home as a private pay person, it's just an extra hoop you have to jump through. 
but basically the individual's income is all going to go to the nursing home every month except for their personal needs allowance which is a whopping 50 bucks and that's what you have left over for getting your hair cut socks and underwear gift for the grandkids anything else like that now if on the other hand we have a married couple we do not want that well spouse living in the community to be completely impoverished so we have what is known as the community spouse maintenance needs allowance currently that it's two thousand nine hundred and eighty dollars and so what does that mean most people in their 80s or older the husband was the primary breadwinner the wife typically stayed at home looked after the kids so if I've got my same married couple that we used before with $3,500 a month worth of income, in most cases, $2,500 of that is going to be attributed to the husband, $1,000 to the wife. If he goes in the nursing home, she's going to keep her $1,000 of income, but then get $1,980 of his to bring her up to $2,980. He will keep his $50 personal needs allowance, and this married couple is then paying less than $500 a month to the nursing home, and Medicaid is paying the difference. So that is what that all means. And if that well spouse is still out in the workforce, and let's say she's making $5,000 a month, none of her income has to go to the nursing home, but she's not going to get any of his income. Asset limits, the fifth and final test. The individual going on to Medicaid can have no more than $2,000 worth of countable assets. Again, that's pretty much everything that's liquid. If I have a well spouse, he or she automatically gets to keep $119,240 of assets that are not otherwise exempt. For Medicaid qualification, the following assets are exempt. The house and all contiguous land, one car, a prepaid funeral or burial fund valued at up to $10,000, all of their, as I like to call it, stuff. China furniture, jewelry, guns, whatever. And then the entire value of any IRA or 401k, as long as for the individual going on to Medicaid, he or she is taking distributions from that that includes some principal. Now, before I started practicing elder law, I had no idea how many old men have young wives. <laughs> but there are a lot of them. So I've got quite a few couples where there's at least a 15 year age difference between the spouses. So I might have a 75 year old man who needs to be in a nursing home with a 60 year old wife who's not even old enough for Medicare yet. And if she's still working, she could have a half a million dollars in her 401k, and she doesn't have to touch it for that to be exempt and him to still be able to qualify. So always bear those kinds of things in mind. Now, in the Medicaid world, unlike the VA world, when we give away assets, that creates penalties. And the penalty is, is while you're in a penalty period, Medicaid won't pay for the nursing home. So right now for every increment that we give away of 5931, that creates a one month penalty. So if we give away $60,000, 10 months. $600,000, 100 months. But the farthest that Medicaid can look back is five years, 60 months. So if we gave away assets today and waited for five years in a day, it would be as if we had never owned that asset. So things can always be done. And 
the $14,000 per person per year uh, exclusion from having to file a gift tax return, that's irrelevant in the Medicaid world. Another thing that we want to look at in the Medicaid world that a lot of people really get worked up over is Medicaid estate recovery. And what that says is that if somebody went on to Medicaid to pay for their long-term care, once that person dies, Medicaid can come back and collect against those assets for whatever Medicaid paid for the care. Now, Georgia being the progressive state that we are, <laughs> was state number 49 out of 50 to put Medicaid estate recovery into effect. So we've actually only had this since 2007, and there's almost no case law on it whatsoever. State number 50, for those of you all who are interested, was Michigan. Let's see, no. And Mississippi is really harsh on this too. Um, in general, in Georgia, the only asset that we're worried about is the house. While we have what's called expanded Medicaid estate recovery, they have yet to try to collect against life insurance policies, um, jointly owned bank accounts, um, or IRAs. So the house is the main thing. There's always something that can be done with these assets, so don't be worried about that too much. Yep. I have a question about asset stocks and bonds. So if we have those stocks and bonds contained with the brokerage firm and they are not in an IRA, then that's part of your asset that you've got to get rid of. Mm -hmm. But if they are in an IRA that's exempt if you're taking the regular distribution. Correct. So putting them in an IRA is an advantage. What's the disadvantage of having them in an IRA? Um, if you don't need um, long-term care and Medicaid, then every time you take assets out of there, in general, they're going to be treated as ordinary income and taxed as ordinary income. But from a savings perspective and for a Medicaid qualification purposes, IRAs are great because you're not paying any tax until you're taking money out. And then if you happen to be in a nursing home, of course, 100 percent of the nursing home costs is an unreimbursed medical expense. Um, for the most part in Georgia, it's only going to deal with a skilled nursing facility. We do have some wavered programs. The qualification is roughly the same, but since they're wavered programs, they're typically underfunded and they're long waiting lists. And at most, the CCSP program will pay for about 40 hours a week of in-home care, which leaves an incredible amount of hours uncovered. Can somebody over here have a question? Yeah. Question about just, uh, the differences between the states. Are they wildly different than the 50 different states, or are they similar? Would you say this is similar? They're similar, uh, but I mean, I was talking with an attorney from Florida the other day, and she was asking me, you know, if I did this, which is what I would do in Florida, would that fly in Georgia? And I'm like, nope, <laughs> that's not going to do you a lick of good. And states like Florida and Texas, for instance, have a huge homestead exemption, which would keep a house even out of the estate recovery realm. Um, in Georgia, for instance, we can use a promissory note, but that only flies in about 10 states. In Georgia, the IRAs are completely exempt. In a bunch of other states, they're not. So it's kind of all over the map. So back to the IRA question, the, for VA, IRA does not protect the assets. That's right. So in the VA world, that counts towards their asset limit. So then the only option you have is to put the money in a trust or give it away. Or in the VA world, we can put it into a single premium immediate annuity, in which case 
they will look at that as being an income stream as opposed to an asset. So a single premium immediate annuity. In general, I hate annuities, um, but that's the one place where they will actually work for us. <laughs> well, that's right. The, the biggest issue, though, is is anything going to return twenty one twenty a month? And so even if the annuity itself is really kind of breaking even, then to get the benefit in general, it's worth it. How long the applicable state? Does it make sense if you have a relative in another state to hire an attorney, a valid care attorney in that state or here? In general, wherever the person is going to be living is where you want your elder law attorney to be. And if you all ever need help with elder law attorneys outside of the state of Georgia, don't hesitate to get in contact with me because I know somebody in almost every state. And I, I you know, um, I am the, actually the chair of the elder law section of the State Bar of Georgia right now. And I used to be the chair for the NALA chapter in Georgia. So I know a lot of people all over the place. Um, as you can probably guess, um, DFACS in Georgia um, is a mess. Um, I'm sure you've seen all the issues of children falling through the cracks and all of those kinds of things. This is the same agency that makes the eligibility determinations for Medicaid for nursing homes. Um, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Again, like the VA, they do nothing quickly, although they have a 45-day statute of promptness. We see in about 80% of our cases that we actually have to go to a fair hearing in front of an administrative law judge just due to the fact that defects is run beyond their time frame. So um, just so you all know and understand, you know, we're not gonna take somebody who's got a million dollars worth of assets and put them onto Medicaid. Um, we're typically dealing with people who've got less than, less than that. But, so you also get a notion, if I'm dealing with a married couple, in general, we can preserve 100% of their assets and most if not all of their income. And if we've got a single person, we can preserve somewhere between 50 and 75% of their assets and none of their income. And we're typically trying to do that so that we can make their lives better within whatever type of care level they're in. What we're really trying to do is use people's assets to provide them the best care possible for the rest of their lives. Okay? Uh, Medicare, Medicaid combination. Uh, in the past, essentially, if you had Medicare uh, for Medicare disability, income you were getting from Medicare was higher than the income level for Medicare and this allowed you for an M&M. Is that still the case? I'm not sure I'm following the question. There's an income requirement to get out of Medicaid. Yes. Right? And uh, in the past, the money that you would get from Medicare uh, and Social Security, Medicaid disability or Social Security benefits, okay, uh, was higher than that Higher than the level, uh, than the level of Medicaid. right? So is that the same thing? Can you, can you not be getting Social Security and uh, or Medicaid disability and be getting Medicaid at the same time? Um, it depends upon which kind of Medicaid you're talking about, because we've got about 35 different Medicaid programs in Georgia. But for just the medical coverage, you would be looking at um, having to have hit that poverty level in order to get it. So if you had, you know, Social Security disability that was paying you $2,000 a month, you're not going to get Medicaid um, as your secondary on that. Uh, 
Uh, if there's a divorce, it's going to cut off the ability to make a claim for the non-veteran. So if your parents are divorced, your parents are divorced um, and your father served in the military, mom can't get it. All right, um, thank you all. And if you all ever have any questions about any of this, please feel free to call our office. Um, we'll triage your situation at no cost to you and are happy to uh, really serve as a clearinghouse of information for all of these kinds of things. There's also some information in the back. Uh, on the outside, if any of you all have any, any interest in that. So again, thank you.